Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of The Conservative Corner. I'm Elliot Margolis. I'm here with my co-host, Gail Burke. And our special guest today is Damien Ankenteel, running for the state senate against Joan Lovely. Now, before you even ask, I'm going to tell you we've invited Joan Lovely on the show. She has declined. So, anyhow, I've got some questions that uh, really are some of my pet peeves, okay? Mm -hmm. For instance, going from Beverly to Boston, we have to pay a toll if you want to go over the Mystic Bridge. Nobody from the South Shore has to pay a toll. Why are we paying uh, for the big dig? And why can't we just take the toll out altogether? Because the state's got plenty of money. <laughs> State's got plenty of money. That's all right. That's for sure. Uh, well, first of all, uh, one of the things that we have to talk about is getting rid of the tolls. We have to get rid of them. I know they, they say they need it for road improvements, things like that. But the tolls are put in there to pay for the big dig and also pay for the mass pike. Uh, the mass pike. Those are paid for. They're done and gone. They just keep it in to allow people to have to continue to pay on and on and on and on so that they can get revenues every single year to disperse in a, in a manner in which they want to. Originally, those funds were created to pay off those, those road projects. But now those road projects are done. Now it's just a slush fund money that they can put anywhere they want and do whatever they want with it. So I do agree with you that they do need to be taken down and that we should stop, uh, stop, stop that unfair tolling on the way into Boston. Well, I hate getting that orange sticker every time I drive into Boston and come into my house, that orange card saying you owe $3.50. I just One of our like representatives, it. and I won't tell you which one because it really doesn't matter whether it's Joan Lovely or Jerry Paracella, but, but they said to me, well, the federal government won't let us put up any more tolls. Well, bull. The federal government is always in favor of more money. So that's irrelevant, but that's the kind of excuse that you get, you know, and it just doesn't wash with me. Uh -huh. They also said, well, the South Shore has more state representatives, so they have more power than we have here in the North. Mm -hmm. Well, again, uh, the tolls should be taken down. It's unfair. I don't know why they um, uh, figured out this is the way that they got to do it. Maybe because there was a bunch of uh, work that needed to be done and they were going to be utilizing the project as it was being built and they figured they were going to build that area off without the tolls. I don't know why the tolls are there or not there, but I do agree with you. They do need to be taken down. Stop the tolls. <laughs> well, I also have a pet peeve and it's voter ID. Mm -hmm. The more I read about <clears throat> Massachusetts and the motor voter rule, the more concerned I get because, number one, we know there are millions of illegals coming into, into uh, the United States with no vetting. Uh, and they're dispersed everywhere. I know there are many in Boston. I know there are uh, some out in the burbs. What do you do to convince the legislature that we need voter ID? And they don't seem to want to do it. Well, right now there's there's going to be a voter ID on the ballot, I think, in two years, four years. But they, there is a... Years? Uh, years, yeah. <laughs> but for the motor voter um, issue, I think we talked about it in the last election cycle. We talked about the driver's licenses for illegals. But inside of that statute, there is a uh, statute that the part of the statute is to stop the workers at the motor vehicles, um, at the registry of motor vehicles, from checking identification and citizen, um, citizenship and legal status in the country. So they can't ask for any documentation on the status of their immigration in this state by statute, by law. My That's opponent, outrageous. Joan Lovely, actually signed that and said that it's a good idea. It was an, uh, an attachment on top of the original law. After that law was passed, 
they went ahead and pushed the motor voter rolls, which actually said everybody that goes gets their driver's license will automatically you be put it. onto the registry yeah. um, on, on the um, onto the uh, voter rolls unless they opt out. So they put it as an opt out issue rather than an opt in. <laughs> so, so right now there are. Um, last time I looked back in March, there was um, t March April. There was about two hundred and fifty thousand illegal immigrants who. Um, filed for driver's licenses. Oh, but they're not illegal immigrants. They're now called new arrivals. You know, they, they can call <laughs> them. You know, if, if I'm correct, Joan Lovely is a, a, an attorney. She is. So the question is, what part of illegal doesn't she understand? I don't know. I went to school with her at Salem State College. So we got our bachelor's in political science together. We were in the same program, graduated the same year. And uh, we, we saw a lot of classes together. And uh, doesn't surprise me that she wouldn't know what that means. <laughs> so, okay. Now, another one of my pet peeves. Okay, I got a bunch of them. <laughs> uh, state legislature is a part-time job, but you get full-time pay, full-time benefits, and you can con continue with your other job. How is that fair to the taxpayer? Well, it's not. I mean, state legislatures originally, when they were created, were was. I don't want to say volunteer, but it was a call to service. So they would go there and then they'd spend their time. And then they would go back to their job after they were done serving in the, the period of time. For a limited time. Yeah. yeah. Back in the day, it was, you know, from after Christmas <coughs> to about April. Then you got the spring, you know, you had to plant all your crops and all that. So you'd go back home, take care of your stuff, uh, do, do another session a uh, little bit in the summer, then leave that session. Uh, harvest your crops, then do a, you know something right before Christmas. So it was a legitimate part-time job. But now you have these legislatures who get this a massive amount of money, about seventy-five, seventy-six thousand dollars on top um, as a base pay, and then a bunch of little uh, stipends and benefits on, after that. But so it's not fair. Just so you know, I'll just say that right out. It's not fair that they they get that full-time payment, plus they go back to their career. But they do spend more time there than they used to. So that the sessions are longer, so they do spend a lot more time there. But as Ben Franklin, I think it was Ben Franklin or Thomas Jefferson said, you know, the, every time that Congress is in session, your rights are in jeopardy. Well, it's the same with the, the, the um, state legislature, too. Every time that they're in session, our our rights are in jeopardy. And we're seeing that right now with the uh, Second Amendment and what's happening with the H4885 legislation that just got passed and signed into law where they're trying to ban um, people from carrying and owning firearms in the state. They say it's not a ban, but technically 80% of all the people who have a firearm in their home will become felons overnight. So that's just Massachusetts. That's just Mass. Yeah, yeah that's just it's our too state. Too bad that doesn't apply to somebody like Kamala Harris, who <clears throat> on TV said that she, if somebody tried to get in her house, she'd shoot them. Yeah, and on the <laughs> Second Amendment. So tomorrow, the 26th, we're going to be in, Dan in front of Danvers Library from three o'clock library from three o'clock to six o'clock, collecting signatures to put the petition on the ballot for the 20, uh, 26. Um, ballot um, initiative. So we're hoping to get that done um, and get the 50,000 signatures that we need. So we're going to be there tomorrow. So if you want to come by tomorrow uh, between 3 and 6 at the Danvers Library, we're going to be right there. You have mobility issues, we'll come right to your car. We're going to be lined up. People can just drive right in. It's right at the turnaround. Easy access. We did it with the driver's licenses uh, for a legal immigrant petition as well. So a Good. couple of years back. Um, I wanted to ask you <clears throat> about uh, the, the crime that is increasing, uh, despite what some of the major networks are saying that crime is down. Um, from other things I've, I've heard, it certainly is not down. They're just not counting certain crimes anymore. Mm -hmm. But in Boston, there was an El Salvador illegal immigrant rapist and he's finally been, and he was deported eight times, eight times, kept coming back. He finally was sentenced in Boston for illegally re-entering the United States. 
<clears throat> Again, the legislature seems to close its eyes to all of this, and we know the governor and the lieutenant governor do. Um, as a state senator, what can you do to to halt this kind of thing, this, all these illegals being <clears throat> deported and coming back mm -hmm. into the state of Massachusetts? Well, there's a couple things that are in work here. First of all, we have a policy that allows illegal immigrants. So a major portion of our crime right now is coming from the illegal immigrant um, uh, population. So what's happening is that we have a large influx of illegal immigrants. Right now there's about 1.2 million illegal immigrants in this state. If you look at what happened, and even it's, you know, it's everywhere. If you look at what happened over the news in the last couple of days in Nahant with the uh, four rapists, that uh, alleged rapists, um, they are now, uh, those are from El Salvador as well. But one of the things that we have to look at is a legislative aspect to stop the funding, to stop the, the influx of illegal immigrants into the state. So we need to stop the funding. If we stop the funding, a large number of them will leave immediately on their own, self-deport. We don't have to worry about anything. Now, for those that don't, if they violate the law, we detain them until they can get an ICE detainer um, on them, and then they, they have a um, deportation hearing. And then the third thing that we need to do is that we need to back our police. Right now, our police officers are afraid to do their job because, they're, because even my opponent she has uh, reduced the ability for police to do their job by eliminating the uh, tools necessary to do that, by eliminating or reducing their ability to claim qualified immunity. Police officers now, their qualified immunity has been stripped from them to the point that they can put on their uniform and drive a car, and that's about the only qualified immunity that they really have. They can't go and do their job without fear of retribution, lawsuits, uh, loss of job, loss of pension. So we need to build back that qualified immunity. The same immunity that the legislature and the people up at Beacon Hill have. They do not have any liability, civil or criminal, for what they do on, as part of their job. The judges do not have any crim criminal or civil liability. But the very people that we ask to go out and implement the policies, the laws that we expect to be followed in a civil society, they don't have qualified immunity. They can be sued for arresting somebody. They can be sued for doing their job, the job that we're asking them to do, put their lives on the <clears> line, <throat> and then they can lose everything that they have. Doesn't I think that's sense. very unfair, and we need to co make that correction. I myself have been in law enforcement before the qualified immunity was gone. And I'll tell you, I, <laughs> they're, they're, they'll, you'll be sued for every little stupid little thing. I mean, and I've seen it with my own eyes, with people getting in trouble That's for that. the difference between conservative and liberal. Right. Common sense and no sense at all. That's the difference. And it's not conservative and it's not a liberal thing. Yeah. There are Democrats and liberal police officers that need these protections, and there are conservative and, and Republican um, police officers that need these protections. It's about common sense. We're asking people to do something that is dangerous. We're asking somebody to do something on our behalf and we're stripping them of all their protections. And also there's other procedural issues that I think that police officers need to have in the community to be able to do their job. They need more training. They need more hands-on training, physical activity. Um, I would say, you know, um, th since the George Floyd, George Floyd thing, um, my opponent has uh, put in the, the qualified immunity uh, reduction issue and also um, some of the um, be abilities to be able to do certain moves. They remove the choke uh, holds, certain arm bar holds, certain physical activities that they need to do to protect themselves and also to take a dangerous person into custody. Now I'm not saying strangle somebody to death, but you know, sometimes you get behind somebody, you have to grab them by you know, the upper body. But if you do that, it's a crime. So well, these most officers... Of the, most of the time that somebody has to be restrained, it's their own fault for well, fighting I, back. I'm assuming that they, if a police officer is restraining somebody, they're restraining somebody because it's a, they're protecting the person who's committing the... That, that's, you know, for the persons that being restrained safety, the police officer's safety, and the community around them safety. Right. So that, police officers just don't restrain people 
willy-nilly, just don't, mm -hmm. you know, handcuff right. them and put them on the ground and keep them restrained. This they, is a major issue. Do it. It's a very dangerous issue. There's not much publicity about it. I wonder where the Boston Globe is, or uh, the Salem News. Why aren't they publicizing these kinds of things? Well, what the police have right to now, with? about um, a few months back, it was 30 percent of the, the all the 911 calls were um, to deal with the legal immigration issue. Now it's about 50-50. So 50 percent of all of our resources for 911 are actually being uh, picked up to deal with um, the issues regarding illegal immigrants. Are Getting be back to my crankiness, Go ahead. okay? <clears throat> um, we're spending a lot of money on illegals. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that money is in the schools. Yes. Okay, and the problem I have is that these, a lot of these people don't speak English. So we have to have teachers working with them separately and ignoring our own citizens. Uh, now, I've, I mean, people in Massachusetts say, well, Massachusetts has one of the best educational systems in the country. That may be true, but being the best in a lousy system is nothing to brag about. Mm -hmm. So, in Israel, just as an example, if somebody comes to move to Israel and wants to go to school, they have to learn Hebrew first. So they go into what's called an ulpan, which is a special school, ballpark six months, mm -hmm. and they are immersed in the language so that they can teach, so they can go back to school and have the language. Yeah. Why can't we do that in this country or in this, in this state? Because the, it's not only the cost of dollars, it's the cost of a lack of education that our kids, our citizens, our pa parents are not getting good services mm -hmm. out of the education. Well, there's a couple things that are in work there as well. So you got the no child left behind that just pushes kids regardless of what they get for grades forward. Yeah. And also um, the illegal immigration, the people that have issues uh, speaking English, don't, don't, can't speak English very well, or don't at all. Have to, the teachers have to deal with this. So just recently, uh, two weeks ago, a Danvers uh, received five students from Peabody. One of those students was pushed in from Peabody to Danvers because they stabbed somebody. Whether they stabbed the staff or a student, I don't know, but they stabbed somebody. Another person was there because he was using, uh, he was high during class. He was you mean they were switching schools? They moved them from Peabody to Danvers, five students. Now the other three, I don't know what they were there for, but none of them spoke English, and they were put into this curriculum. And, and so the, these students were placed there. Now, when you, if a student becomes a problem, I think you should just be able to expel. We can't expel anymore. Mm -hmm. We can't throw children, uh, I don't want to say children, in high schools, young men and women, you know, they're 16, 17, 18 years old, and, you know, they can go off to war, you know, they can, you know, at 17, 18 years old, they can join the military, you know, they're young men and women. And if they can't behave well enough to, to deal with the rules and regulations of the school, they should be expelled. You throw a few people out of school and you, you'll correct that. As for illegal immigration, I don't think our schools should house one or, or educate one illegal immigrant. If we're going to educate them, we should have a separate school specifically for them because they're not going to be tied into our school. They haven't been brought up through our, our traditions, our habits. Mm -hmm. The way that we run our schools <laughs> is completely different than the ways they run schools in other countries. Uh, Mexico, El Salvador, over in uh, Nigeria, wherever people are coming from. Well, that's the problem. You're dealing not with one or two different foreign languages. You could be dealing with 10 or 20, yeah. all speaking different languages. How, mm -hmm. <clears throat> how are teachers supposed to deal with that? How mm -hmm. are the taxpayers supposed to afford that? Mm -hmm. And what happens to the other kids in the class if you're teaching five different languages to, to a group of students and you have American English speaking uh, students, who has time for them? Okay. And the results yeah. are obvious yeah. because we see the, the horrible scores that are coming through. Well, we need to remove those students from the school. Yeah. We need, if we're going to do something, we have to do it separately. And 
tailor them towards learning the, the English language. And I think that that's one thing. And also learn the rules and regulations of our school system. You show up at a certain time, you sit in your chair, you pay attention to your teacher, you have a certain respect for your teacher, and if they can't follow the rules in a secondary school, then they should not even be entered into the school. Now, I went to a forum a few weeks ago with some teachers. It wasn't even some teachers. It was 100, 200 teachers. And uh, it was over on Cabot Street at the church over there. And they had a forum. And one of the things that they were talking about is they were talking about um, how teachers are assaulted, threatened, children, uh, men and women, young men and women, the students getting in teachers' faces, spitting at them. One woman was talking about her, you know, she was a, one of the speakers. She was talking about she was worried about going to work the week before her wedding so that, you know, she was afraid that she was going to have bruises on her showing up at her wedding pictures. And to me, that is unbelievable. So, again, Where, if you... Where's the principal of the school? Where's so the superintendent Some of schools? the stories that they talked about, they would remove the student <laughs> from the classroom. The, you know, this is after an outburst. The student would go off to the principal's office, come back five minutes later with the candy, you know, some candy, and being able to bring back in the class. Now, no one being a correctional officer, working with people in violent and, and um, crazy situations, I know that there's a wind down time. So those students that are in that classroom, even though they weren't misbehaving, they have something, you know, triggered in their head. They watched a violent assault against a teacher. They watched a, t a student getting wrestled to the ground and then restrained, brought out, and then brought back in. Those are not good educational uh, environments. And the teachers are trying to speak out against that. Now, as for this, I think that a teacher should have the right to, if a student threatens a teacher or assaults a teacher, I think that teacher should have the right to be able to file charges outside of the administration. I believe that that teacher should be able to demand an expulsion on that student. No teacher should be, have to work in a school system that they feel a threat for their physical, huh, their physical safety. It's wrong, and we need to do something about it. What now, about the you? And the unions. Why don't the unions? It's an administrative aspect. All there's the unions want to do is yeah. raise money. Well, the, the, there's the legislative unions are things. useless. Yeah. yeah. They're, well, there's they're not good for education. unions are fighting for it a little bit, but there's legislative things that are in place. Like I said, the no child left behind. It's very difficult to expel a student. I don't even think that you can anymore. I don't think it's legal for you to be able to expel. But I would well, think that a has teacher. has the backbone to do uh, it, even if it was. And I also think that if a teacher is protecting themselves, <laughs> feel threatened, and need to protect themselves, that, you know, then one of the big things they brought up is they're afraid to get sued. They have to get hit. They have to take a beating from a student. They have to get spit on. I don't think that that's right because they're afraid to get sued. They're afraid to get fired. They're afraid to get disciplined. We need to figure out a way and have a deeper conversation with the teachers, the teachers' unions, to figure out a procedure. And the parents. And the, the parents. The parents need to know what's going on yeah. in the classroom. And create and some legislation. Really yeah, and create some legislation <clears throat> that's going to be able yeah. to protect the Working teachers together. in some sort of qualified immunity, maybe not to the level that police officers have or uh, correctional officers. But if a teacher is threatened by a student and has to defend themselves, I don't think that there's any reason why they shouldn't have a qualified immunity to, to, for that defense. And um, I think that that's something that we need to look at. One other thing I wanted to talk about was <clears throat> squatting. Mm. When, <clears throat> and it happens, well, the, the stories I've been reading about, it's mostly illegal immigrants mm. that <clears throat> they're looking for a place to live. Um, of course, we provide many homes and, and housing for many of the immigrants that come in. But there are also some that know exactly what they want, and they tell the other immigrants, and they go and take over a piece of property that <clears throat> hasn't been lived in. Even if, it's, if the people are, say, on vacation, they're on a job, they come in. And Massachusetts has stricter laws than other communities, other states. But at the same time, if you come home and you find a, a bunch of strangers living in your home, and you tell them to get out and they don't, what do you mm -hmm. do then? You have to pay a lawyer to come in and, and put it through the legal system? You get your gun. 
<laughs> well, I, I don't know if that's a, a great answer for that, but what I think that, that we need to do is to, to create, right now, with COVID-19, the evictions were on a halted situation, yeah. and that, that and then squatters came in and started taking a major advantage of that. Yeah. And that regulation and that um, laxed attitude towards evictions has continued on even to today. But I think we, that I'd like to explore this further, Damien. But yeah. we are almost out right. of time, well, if you yeah. can believe it. So we want uh, to notice just, what just, <laughs> just one, one quick. <laughs> you can give this a one one word answer if you want. What do you think of making English the official language of Massachusetts? I think it should be. Yes. Okay. okay. Very good. There you go. Now tell now everybody for the next two minutes. <laughs> tell right. us why we should vote for you. All right. I'm Damien Ancatel. I'm running for state senate. That's Peabody, Beverly, Danvers, and Salem. And um, so I'm running. Number one issue, I think, in this community right now is illegal immigration, the issue of illegal immigration. It's creating uh, out of control uh, housing costs, out of control uh, uh, um, drain on our resources for our seniors to get access to certain things that they need, housing, uh, transportation, all that stuff's getting drained by the illegal immigration issue. Uh, students, as you heard earlier today, that we, you know, what I think about illegal immigration in the schools. But illegal immigration today is the, the most dangerous thing in our community. It's making us unsafe. We just need to work a little bit harder, and not even work a little bit harder, but you know, my, my policy on that is <coughs> defund them, I think they'll self-deport. Detain them, if they break the law, they need to be de detained until ICE can come in and do a detainer hearing on them. And third of all, we need to defund them. The only money I want to give to illegal immigrants is to send them off on the way back to their own, uh, their own country. And um, so I do think that there's some, some money that needs to be spent. But you can learn more about me, my campaign, at www.votedamian.com. That's www.votedamian.com. And uh, like I said, we're going to be collecting signatures tomorrow in front of the Danvers Library um, for the uh, repeal the gun law that's going to be banning guns and uh, restricting our Second Amendment right. So again, you can learn more about me or you can come by tomorrow and meet me personally. And I hope to see you there. So thank you very much, Damien, for coming on. It's a pleasure as always. Well, thank you for and having me. And thank <coughs> you, Beverly. And um, we thank our audience for watching. Um, <clears throat> we hope that you, we've given you enough information. Uh, if not, you can always go to Damien's website. And we will be back with you <clears throat> in a short period of time. And we hope to keep you informed about what's going on in the community, uh, as far as the elections and other uh, problems that we have in the state. Thank you. See you soon.